Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in him righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's offer this Bible study to the Lord. Jesus, ever since we came to you by faith and received you as Lord and Master of our life, we have lived with expectation of the day that we read about here. The day when the clouds will part and you shall return to the earth, not in humility and as a suffering servant, but as the victorious King of kings and Lord of lords. We long for that day. We rejoice in that day. The day when the curse will be removed from the earth and we will be with you for all of eternity. So Lord, as we read about these glorious things, Lord, may the heart of expectation come upon all of us and that, Lord, that we would fix our eyes on this day so that the things of this life, knowing that they will soon pass away, will not overwhelm us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a mind to understand what you, the Spirit, would say to us, the church. Give us a heart to receive this glorious gospel, for truly is glorious, and it is the good news of the coming King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The return of the king. As we look at verse 11, this is the fulfillment of a prophecy that was given all the way back at the beginning in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve fell and they sinned and God appeared before them, he prophesied, he told them the curse that they would live under, told them the toil that they would have to endure Told them that told Eve that she would bring forth children uh, into this world by pain, and told Adam that as he works for a living, that it would be hard labor and it would cost him something in his life. But then he gave a message of hope. Don't you love that about the Lord? That no matter when he chastises us, anybody ever been chastised by the Lord? By the way, anybody? Only the true sons and daughters get chastised. If you don't raise your hand, you must not be a true son and daughter, right? No, yeah, we know, you, you know. You've been chastised by the Lord. But don't you love it that when he chastises us, he doesn't go too far? And he, do, he only chastises us in according to his mercy and love. And in his mercy and love, he did not allow Adam and Eve to live forever in their cursed state. He put them out of the Garden of Eden but he also gave them a redemptive prophecy. And this, what we read here in chapter 19, is the fulfillment of that prophecy. God told Adam and Eve that from her womb would come a child, and the serpent would bruise his heel, speaking of Christ coming into the world as a babe, and he would leave this life crucified on the cross for the redemption of mankind. That is the serpent bruising his heel. But it doesn't end there. God goes on to say that the serpent will bruise his heel, but you, meaning Messiah, will crush his head. I like that. Your King James may say bruise, but literally in the Hebrew, as in the Greek, it means to annihilate. Anybody looking forward to the day that Satan's annihilated? Is anybody looking forward to that day? I mean, annihilated, destroyed, crushed, ground to powder as if he never existed. This is what we read here. It is the second coming of our glorious, great God and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Paul said in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, may the, bo- may the God of all peace soon crush Satan under your feet. And so what we have here is the fulfillment of a prophecy that was given 
all the way back in the beginning. And this is a description of the countenance of the Lord and the coming of the Lord and the conquering of the Lord. John said this in verse 11, now I saw heaven open. This is the second time that John has told us that heaven was open before his eyes. The first time it was in Revelation chapter four, he said, I saw heaven open and I heard a voice that said, come up here and I will show you the things that must soon take place. So one Bible commentator put it this way, the first time heaven was open, it was to let John into heaven to see what would take place. But the second time heaven was open was not to let John in, but to let Jesus out. Yeah, I like that. Let Jesus out. The heavens are going to open a second time and it will be to let Jesus come from heaven to earth. And this is not something that will be done in secret. We're told over and over in the New Testament, especially in Revelation chapter one, it said he is coming in the clouds and all will see him. Rich and poor, black and white, famous, infamous, whoever's alive on the earth, all will see the coming of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I got good news for you. Jesus longs for this day also. He is longing to come back to the earth to do away and vanquish Satan and do away with the effects of sin. That's going to be a glorious day. And it says here that he saw heaven open and behold, and the word behold means that this is something that's grabbed John's attention. He's transfixed by this. This is something so glorious that he can't look away. And I like that, that the Lord wants to do something so glorious in our life that we can't look away, nor do we want to look away. Paul told the Colossians, if ye then being raised with Christ, set your affections on things above and not here on the earth, for Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. And when he appears, you who love him will appear with him. So we look to heaven, and what we, God wants us to see is that one, Jesus is on the throne. Two, Jesus is interceding for us day and night and never ceases to intercede for us. And then third, Jesus is going to rise from his throne and he is going to come back to the earth to rule and reign in the city of Jerusalem. And he, when he comes, he's coming on a white horse. Kings, in the time that John was living, when they would come to a town, they would either ride on a mule or a horse. A mule was a sign that he is coming in peace to bring prosperity. We're told in Matthew chapter 21 that Jesus came into Jerusalem on what we traditionally call Palm Sunday to the cheers of Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna which means God saves, God saves, God saves. And those who have translated the scriptures and those who have put footnotes to the scripture call this the triumphant procession of Jesus, his triumphant return to Jerusalem. But literally, that is not the triumphant procession of Jesus because he, when he came to Jerusalem, he came in humility to die for the sins of mankind. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in chapter nine, verse 28, he said that Jesus will appear a second time, not for sin, but for salvation. Do you like that? He's gonna appear a second time, not for sin, but for salvation. The first time he came on the back of a mule to die for the sins of mankind, but a second time he's coming on the back of a white horse. And he's coming for salvation, which means deliverance. He's coming to deliver the earth from the curse that it has been under for more than 6,000 years. And the curse that's been upon mankind because of what Adam and Eve had done in the Garden of Eden. And a white horse also symbolizes not a king coming in peace, but a king coming to make war. That's something we need to understand, that Jesus, when he comes a second time, there will be no more opportunity for repentance. There will be no more opportunity for salvation. He is coming not to save mankind, but to deliver those who had placed their faith in him that were here on the earth during the tribulation, and also to annihilate the works of Satan and to make war against all those who have rejected him. 
a white horse. A white horse is also the animal that a general rode when he had come in victory. So really, even though there's going to be called the war of Armageddon, there is no war. It's just like the war in heaven before the foundation of the earth when Satan tried to overthrow God. There was no struggle. There was no vicious fight. Satan tried to overthrow God, and God, Isaiah says, threw Satan to the earth violently. It was done in a blink of an eye. He comes on a white horse, and look at the name that he's given him. And it says, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. This is in direct contrast to the beast that will be ruling over the earth at the time, the Antichrist, because the Antichrist is not faithful and he is not true. He is a liar and he's possessed by the father of lies. He's also not faithful because he makes a treaty with the nation of Israel, promises them seven years of peace, but halfway through, 42 months into the peace treaty, he breaks the peace treaty. He is not faithful. He is faithless. But Jesus is not faithless. Jesus is faithful. And he is true. He is absolute truth. When Jesus gives a promise, he never goes back on his word. He never changes his mind. He never becomes distracted. Here are just a couple of promises we have from the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 33, call upon me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things you do not yet know. Isn't that an awesome promise? Jesus says, call upon me. He didn't say call upon me if you're having a good day. Don't call upon me if you're having a bad day. He just says, Call upon me, and I will answer you. That is a promise from the Lord. Isn't that an awesome promise? And show you great and mighty things. And so here it is. That's one promise. Another promise was given to backslidden Israel in Zechariah chapter 1. God told Israel, who was in a backslidden condition, return to me, and I will return to you. Are some of you away from the Lord today? Are some of you not as close to the Lord as you should be? And you know where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be in intimate fellowship with him. God says, hey, don't run from me. Don't hide from me. Don't just stay in the same state. Return to me and I will return to you. Jesus makes a promise also in the same type of language. In John's gospel chapter six, he says, For all those that would receive me, all that that would come unto me, I will by no means cast out. That is an awesome promise. Jesus is saying to mankind today, come to me, receive me by faith. I am faithful and I am true and I will by no means cast you out. He's not going to cast you out because you have warts from all the sin that you've committed. He's not going to cast you out because he doesn't like you or you're from the wrong nationality. None of those things are applicable. Jesus simply says, come unto me and receive me and I will by no means cast you out. Paul says this about the promises of God. He says, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, for all the promises of God in him, that is in Christ Jesus, are yes and in him, amen to the glory of God through us. It brings God glory for us to call upon the name of Jesus and for him to answer us. It brings God glory that when we are in a backslidden state to return to him and him to return to us. It gives God glory that when we come unto Jesus that he will by no means cast us out. That brings God glory. Paul goes on to say, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, and I love this part, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. To show that the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yes and amen, and that he is faithful and true, he gives us the Holy Spirit who is deposited into our life and seals our life until the day of redemption. The devil may come knocking on the door, but he ain't getting in. He may yell, he may scream, he may manipulate, he may deceive, but no born-again child of God will ever have to worry about being possessed by the boogeyman. 
and being possessed by Satan because you have been sealed unto the day of redemption by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He is faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Uh, The word judgment means he weighs out. He's weighed out the deeds of those who are left here on earth after the rapture and after the seven year tribulation and he's weighed out their life and what happens is because he is righteous he has no other alternative but to make war because this is mankind who has volitionally rejected Jesus Christ rejected his deity rejected his sacrifice rejected his mercy rejected his grace and we've read through that through the revelation over and over again how man instead of repenting and turning toward God by coming to faith in Jesus they shook their fists and blasphemed the name of God and he is righteous and he is unjust and he has weighed out man and he makes war. It says here in verse 12, his eyes were like the flame of fire, the purity of the Lord, the holiness of the Lord. And on his head were many crowns. This is the crown of, the, of, of a deity. This is the crown of a sovereign king, a sovereign potentate. And the reason crown is in plural is that all the kings of the earth, All those who are ruling and reigning now have been subjugated to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There is no one like our King. There is no comparison to our King. There's no one more powerful or wiser than our King. And when all is said and done, all the kings of the earth, no matter how powerful they are or no matter how bad they are, what despots they are, we're hearing about these guys, this guy over in North Korea, we hear about China, we hear about Russia, we hear about the Ayatollah over in Iran, and these are bad guys. They're bad dudes. There's the evil people, and they're causing the world to shake and fear and trembling. But when Jesus Christ comes, there'll be no bad dudes left. Because they're going to take that crown and they are going to throw it at his feet because they will have no choice because he's coming not for sin but for salvation and for deliverance and to rule and reign. So the best advice I can give to all these bad dudes, repent before it's too late because all this living that you're living It's coming to an end, baby. It's coming to an end. And it can be either beautiful or ugly. The choice is yours. It says here, verse 12, his eyes were like flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. What is that name? I don't know. It says no one knows except himself. I'll take a stab at what I think John is telling us is that The name of Jesus is so wonderful and so marvelous and so multidimensional that in this life we will never exhaust the treasures, the priceless treasures of what his name means to us. That's what I think is going on here, is that you will never exhaust your knowledge of Jesus Christ. You can never learn enough. You'll never learn all there is about him because just when you think you've learned everything, you find out there's so much more to learn about our beautiful, wonderful Savior. I heard someone say that you know that you've become a wise man when you come to this knowledge. You know that you don't know. Some of you are there today. You know there's a lot more that you don't know than you know, and that may be a symbol of wisdom. And I think that the symbol of wisdom for us is that Jesus is so wonderful. Jesus is so marvelous. Jesus is so gracious that we will never, ever exhaust everything that we can know about him. Isn't that beautiful? I love that about Jesus. Ruth and I were speaking to a a waiter that was waiting on us this week, and he was very troubled because he had fallen in love. Any young man that falls in love, yes, that can be very troubling very troubling. And so the conversation went on. He was sharing with us. And my only thought, I told Ruth, my only thought is, I mean, I hope this girl loves him as much as he loves her. Because she was in New York and he was on the ship finishing out his contract. And he was sharing with us, he was troubled. We knew something was going on with him. And so we were able to, the Lord opened up a door for us to talk with him. 
And he goes back to when he was younger that his grandmother died. And ever since then, he just lost his uh, idea of religion. He just gave up on God and religion. And I, I'll tell you, I shared with him, and you guys have done this. You know how to do this. I shared and said, you know, what we're sharing with you, Mark, is not religion. Religion's about a set of rituals. It's about a set of high holy days. It's a set of laws that you have to fall, follow. We're talking about a relationship with God, that God desires to have a relationship with you. And that we were able to speak with Mark. You know, I'm not saying that he came to faith in Christ, but the Lord opened up the door that where I gave him my phone number, and I said, when you finish your contract, give me a call. Any question you have, we can talk about it. He was intrigued, and we simply did what I'm doing here today. We shared the name of the Lord Jesus and what he is willing and able to do, not only for young men in love, which they need help, but also for all men and women, no matter what background, no matter what age. And so I think he has a name written that no one knew except himself. And it says here in verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Some commentators think this represents the blood uh, from redemption that he shed on Calvary, and I beg to differ with that. Because again, Hebrews chapter nine, verse 28 says, he appears the second time not for sin, otherwise as a sacrifice for sin, but, all, but as for salvation. So if it's not his blood that he shed on Calvary, what is this blood, what, where's this blood from? What is the source of this blood? Isaiah tells us where the source is. And you can write this down in your notes, Isaiah chapter 63. I'm gonna read the first six verses. It says, who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, the one who's glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save, why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger, and I have trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. Why? For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. And so the blood that's upon the garments of Jesus is not his blood that he shed for the redemption of mankind. But when he turns a second time, his garments are dyed red from the blood of wicked people. His garments, his righteous garments, his garments of beauty, his garments of royalty, his garments that bring peace to us because we have been washed white by the blood of the lamb will be dyed red, not for sacrifice, but for consumption of wicked man. This is it. If those who have rejected Christ at the coming of Christ they will have another opportunity. It's as if Noah, when Noah had the door closed on the ark and the floods came. There's no more opportunities. There's no more second chances. There's no more uh, sermons to be preached. There's no more altar calls to be made. There's no more sharing of one's testimony. Christ comes in his anger and in his vengeance and his recompense to pay mankind for rejecting him. And it says here, his name is called the Word of God. John said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Logos of God. Jesus is a written expression of Almighty God. You want to know what God is thinking? Look to Jesus. And you want to know what God looks like? Look to Jesus. You want to know what God sounds like? Listen to Jesus. Do you know what God feels? Feel the heartbeat of Jesus. Jesus is the logos of God. Jesus is the written word of God. Jesus is Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. This book that we call, the 66 books actually, that we call the Holy Bible is all about Jesus and what he is willing and waiting to do for mankind. Now it says, now out of his mouth, it says here in verse 14 rather, and the armies in heaven, do you see that? Now his coming is described, the armies is in plural in heaven. Who are these armies plural? Well, we know from Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 25, that part of that army are the angels in glory. 
They will return. When Jesus returns in the clouds of great glory, the angels which are in heaven will return with him. But that's just one part of the army. This is a plural word. It is a plural word, and it tells us that the armies in heaven are clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Well, the linen, fine linen, white and clean, we have a, we have a clue who, that's, who are clothed in that. In verse 8 of this chapter, we're told at the marriage supper of the Lamb that the saints, that is the church, born again from Pentecost until the rapture, will be clothed in white linen because it represents the righteousness of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So part of that army that's returning with Jesus are the angels of God, but also the church of the living God. How do I know it's the church? Because they're clothed in white linen, which represents the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Also notice, please don't miss this. It, it, it says here in the armies, verse 14, in heaven. It doesn't say that Jesus returned from heaven and caught up the saints to be with them to return a second time. When Jesus returns a second time, he's coming with the angels and the church that is already in heaven. It is impossible for the church to go through the tribulation. We're not going to go halfway through the tribulation. We're not going to go three quarters away through the tribulation. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we have been made the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We have been made the righteousness of God. And when Jesus comes, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he shall catch up the living and the dead in Christ together to be with him forever. So we're going to heaven but we're coming back with Jesus a second time and we're coming in victory. We're following the captain of our salvation. We're following the hero of our faith. We're following our great God and savior. And you know what I love about this? We followed him on white horses. I've never ridden a horse. <laughs> Ruth has, and she tells me that she knows how to ride well. I've never ridden a horse but I'm not gonna to have to have any lessons because I will be in my perfected state. That's awesome. So I'm gonna put on my best John Wayne and I'm gonna follow the Lord and we are going to have a grand and glorious day. I love that. Amen, amen. It's worth getting excited about, huh? I get all jacked up thinking about what the Lord's doing. I can't wait for this day. And it says here in verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. That sharp sword is a very long sword. It's something that's actually a javelin and that he strikes the nations. He throws it and he always hits his mark. And it says he himself will rule them. The better word than rule is shepherd them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of his Wrath. Wine presses, when they would stomp on the grapes to bring out the juice from within. And it says that he will tread the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Zechariah chapter 14 says this Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Thus the, the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. He's coming to make war, and he comes in the fierceness of his holy, righteous, just wrath, and he tramples upon the wicked men who dwell here on the earth. Revelation chapter 14 tells us that the blood that comes from this vengeance will rise up to the horse's bridle. That is high mark right there. And it says that we will follow him and come with him. And just so you know, when we, when we understand this, that Jesus is the captain of our salvation. Just so you know, we have nothing to worry about. We don't have to worry about how to ride a horse. We don't have to worry about, can I draw my sword out? We don't have to do any of that. We just have to ride looking pretty. Sit there, we'll never break a sweat. We'll never have to, we'll never be able to have to pull our sword because it says here, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness. Not 
he and the church and he and the saints or he and anybody else and he and the angels. It's just he himself. He does this and the wrath of almighty God. Almighty comes from the word where we get mountain. It's literally in the Hebrew, it's El Shaddai. He is almighty. There's no one greater than him. No one stronger than him. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Almighty God is he. We will never have to worry. We come, all we do is follow him to victory. By the way, when we get here to the earth, you know what happens next. We looked at this a few weeks ago. It's the feast of the wedding supper of the lamb. I love that. We are going to feast and some Bible expositors believe that that feast will last for a thousand years. Now that's a buffet. I like that. You don't have to worry about too much fat. You don't have to worry about calories. You don't have to worry about sugar substitutes, which will kill you before sugar does. You don't have to worry about margarine. Thank God there's no margarine in heaven. You don't have to worry about any of those things. You don't have to worry about the pepper giving you heartburn. You don't have to worry about ketchup, you know, rotting out your insides. You don't have to worry about, you know, caffeine. We'll be at the marriage supper of the lamb and we are going to feast with our bridegroom for a thousand years. That's the destination. It says here in verse 16, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Isaiah said it this way. He said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward and evermore. The zeal of the Lord of the hosts will perform this. Paul said this to the Philippians. God has also exalted him, that is Christ, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those of earth and those playing NFL football, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have athletes protesting the national anthem, really? And our flag, but I got news for them. They think that they have the freedom to kneel today and disrespect the flag and the national anthem. There's a coming a day when they won't have the freedom to kneel. They will kneel and they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. It says here in verse 17, now the conquest is described. It says here, then I saw an angel standing in the sun. He is actually blocking the sun and he is there and it says, and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. Some have called chapter 19, the chapter of the two suppers. The first one is in the first 10 verses. It's the wedding supper of the lamb. And if you place your faith in Christ Jesus, you will be an invited guest to that supper. But if you reject Jesus Christ, you will not be an invited guest to that supper. You will be the main course for this supper. That's the way it comes across. You're either going to be a guest at the wedding supper or you're going to be the main course at the great supper of God. That's not a hard choice for me. I I can tell you right now. And it says, come and gather together for the supper of the great king. Look at verse 18, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of all those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And John is told that this great supper, this annihilation of wicked men, will cover the whole earth. The rich the poor, the famous, the infamous, the great men, the not so great men, the noble men, the ignoble men, all slave and free will be annihilated at the great supper of God. Jesus said this about this day in Matthew 24. He said, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be coming of the son of man. That's how quick it's going to be. That's why there's no struggle here. He comes He annihilates wicked man and sets up his earthly kingdom. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the, sun of the, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. How awful will this be? Jesus goes on to say, for then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time no, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. It's the great supper of God. Five different times we're told in verse 18 concerning the flesh that will be consumed by the coming of Jesus Christ. Warren Wiersbe said, even though this is mostly about the consuming of physical flesh, he also sees the consuming of physical flesh because these men have relied on their flesh or their sin nature to spare them judgment. And we see that today. Where people want to cover all their bases and think there's more, there's more than one way to God except through faith in Jesus Christ. Where men are justified themselves in their own mind. Hugh Hefner, 91 years of age, Not much good to say about him. As far as I'm concerned, he's helped destroy the family in America, not make it healthy. He believed that because he was against Puritanism, because of his parents who were strict Methodists, that he liberated mankind, that there's no, there's no sin in premarital sex, there's no sin in living together outside the bounds of holy matrimony, it didn't matter if it was two men or two women. And then he introduced pornography, really, to the American male. And he tried to hedge his bets, since Marilyn Monroe was his first centerfold, that he spent $75,000 to, to be buried next to her for all of eternity. He's relying upon himself. I got news for you. Unless he repented, he'll never see Marilyn again. I don't know if she repented or not. We're told those who are cast into eternal darkness, they're isolated forever, except that the torment of what could have been and the fire that will never go out. Paul said it this way to the Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? He said, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit that is you now being made perfect by the flesh? Are you gonna depend on the strength of the flesh to make you righteous instead of faith in Jesus Christ? And those who place their faith in Jesus are sealed with the Spirit of God until the day of redemption. That is this day, the day that our bodies will be made brand new. But those who depend on the flesh, live and let live, to seek the pleasures of this world, they will be consumed. I shared with Mark, our waiter, and I advised him to read the writings of Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. When he was young and in love, he wrote the song of Solomon. I told him, I said, I got some great tips for you. You can pass on your girlfriend. Read Solomon, and you can tell her that your teeth are as beautiful as goat's teeth. <laughs> your neck is like ivory. I said, you might need to translate in the modern vernacular, but he knows something about love. When he was in his middle years, he wrote Proverbs concerning the wisdom of man, concerning wealth, concerning marriage, concerning so many things in this life. And then Ecclesiastes, he wrote as an elder person, looking back at the vanity of chasing money, chasing women, and chasing fame. It was all fleeting. And he realized he had spent a life chasing something that would never satisfy him. What are you depending on? Are you depending on the spirit of God or are you depending on yourself? Are you chasing wealth? Are you chasing men, chasing women, chasing fame, chasing accumulation of possessions? 
It says here in verse 19, and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth. The kings of the earth are those 10 kings that were given authority to rule for a certain amount of time in Revelation chapter 17. And this is the Antichrist. And notice it says here, they are gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. At the outset, I want to tell you, this is a bad decision they're making. But isn't it interesting that all the fighting, all the intolerance, and all the bigotness, and racism, and all the things that are going on, the one thing that they all agree on is their hatred for God. Isn't that amazing? They can't agree on anything. Whether they should kneel at the anthem or stand for the anthem, whether they should you know, raise taxes or lower taxes, whether they should do this, do that, whatever the case may be. But they do agree on one thing, their hatred for God. Their hatred for God. Read Psalms chapter 2. It says that the nations come together to fight against the Lord and his anointed. And God's response in Psalms chapter 2, he said, me and my anointed one, we scoff at you. We mock you. You little men. Who do you think you are coming against God and his anointed? And it says here, they make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Here's how it goes. Verse 20, then the beast was captured. <laughs> there you go. The beast was kept. That's it. Done. And with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of his beast and those who worshiped his image. In Revelation chapter 13, we are introduced to the beast. And after his mortal head wound is healed, it said here in uh, Revelation 13, it says, and the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon and gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Verse 20 is the answer to that question. Rather, yeah, verse 20 is the answer to that question. Who is able to make war with him? Who is like the beast? And it simply says the beast was captured. <laughs> I like that. No matter how powerful he is, no matter how overwhelming he is, no matter how wise he is in his own eyes, it is simply a moment in time that he is captured along with the false prophet. And it says here, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Twelve times hell is taught in the New Testament. Jesus taught on it ten of those twelve times. It is a place of eternal torment. This idea of annihilation that when your body's thrown into the lake of fire, you'll burn up and cease to exist is a false doctrine and it really takes away from the righteous judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a price that will be paid by man for rejecting Jesus the Christ. They will follow the beast and the false prophet. They will be raised up from Hades, which is the realm of the unseen, where they, the wicked are today in torment and in darkness. They will be raised up, we'll read about that in Revelation chapter 20, given an immortal body and thrown into the everlasting lake of fire. There'll be no opportunities for salvation. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Well, if that's what happens to the wicked, what happens to the righteous? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Where they go to eternal torment, we go to eternal glory. And that's the beauty of placing your faith in Christ. It says here in verse 21, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. That fill means they were gouged. They, they gouged themselves. They gluttoned themselves with the flesh. There will be so many bodies that even after the birds glutton themselves, we're told in Ezekiel 39, it will take seven months to clean up the mess from all these rotting corpses. But it doesn't have to end that way for you. Because there is a verse in the Bible that most of the world knows, but very few pay attention to. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Give your heart to the Lord by faith and you will be a wedding guest. 
reject him, and you will be the main course. The choice is yours. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn you. I came to save you because he has come to give life and life more abundantly. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you that you are coming very soon. We long for that day, and we pray for that day. And Lord, help us by your spirit that you've given us. Help us keep our eyes on you. For when you appear, we shall appear with you in glory. Lord, we know the things of this world. We know the temptations of this world. And Lord, we just need your help. We confess to you as a church, we need your help by your spirit to help us keep our eyes on the unseen rather than the seen. For the unseen is eternal, but the seen is temporary. And if you're here today and you're struggling with that, you're str- I don't know what's going on in your life, but you're struggling. This, this thing of Jesus returning a second time it sounds like a glorious thing, but it's not helping you with your mortgage or helping you with whatever physical thing you're dealing with, not helping you in your marriage. Here's the best therapy I can give you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you're in a backslidden state today, keep your eyes on Jesus and return to him for he will return to you. If you're here today and you realize after this message, I don't have that personal relationship. I don't have that peace. You can by faith. It is simple. By faith, Jesus, by faith, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. And he will clean up your act and he will be with you to the very end. You know why? Because he is faithful and he is true. The guys are going to close this up with a song and I'm just going to invite you. I have prayer partners here in the altar and if you're here today and you would like a personal relationship with Jesus, the choice is yours. Don't wait. Please don't wait. Come today to the Lord. Just come here. Am I saved by going forward? No. But there's something about putting feet to your prayer. Something about coming forward. There's a declaration. Maybe even to yourself that this is it. I'm following the Lord. Prayer partners would love to pray with you. If you're here today, you're discouraged in your walk with the Lord, they'll be glad to pray with you. Whatever needs you may have, the choice is yours. I know this, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Father, we love you for that, and we just pray, Lord, and we pray for those hearts that you've been dealing with, that they would make the most of this opportunity because it's not too late. Be with them, Lord, as they come forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand close to the song. God bless you.